the, that's when, you know, the doctor, the ER doctor kind of looked at me and said, um, it might be multiple myeloma. And I was like, okay. I, just, I could not leave there. I, I slept in that hospital every single night, but two nights, because I was afraid that if I left, a doctor was gonna come in and tell him something else. I had dropped 27 pounds or so in weeks, four to five weeks, because I was just, I was, I was on adrenaline, you know, running on adrenaline. I was in survival mode and all I knew is I, what I had to do. I am Marsha Calloway Campbell. I am a wife of, oh, 37 years. We've been together almost 47, so we were high school sweethearts. I'm a mother of three grown daughters from ages 25, almost 26, up to 34. And I am a Nana, which is grandmother of a two and a half year old grandson. Professional, career oriented, type A overachiever, a Christian, a believer, a family woman. So if I can like back up just a little bit before all of this, we were, um, this household was crazy busy. So imagine three daughters, one danced competitively. So we drove all over the U.S. with her Six years later, a baby came, her sister came, and 20 months later, another sister came. <laughs> so, but the two younger ones were athletes. They played basketball, soccer, volleyball. They tried everything. We were those parents that we let them try everything. And so then we got into travel ball. So there were times that he would put one in the car to go to Atlanta. I would put another in the car to drive to Chicago. So that's who we were. We were we were gym rats. He was an athlete. I played ball um, in high school. It continued even into college for the two younger ones. They were college athletes, student athletes. So that's kind of the synopsis of us before, let's call it 2016. And that's when, you know, he started not to feel well and things started changing. So Amre was a black man. And I will say that because many black men don't go to the doctor, but he was one that did. So he got yearly physicals. And in 2016, he had gotten a yearly physical, probably July-ish. Um, August, September came, he started not to feel well. He started seeing other doctors. They said, um, well, maybe go to a urologist, maybe go to, you know, because when men get a certain age, he was 57 at the time. Um, they said he had a slightly enlarged prostate, but nothing huge, but go to a urologist. So that was fine. Nothing was making him feel better. We get to Thanksgiving. He stayed in the bed the whole weekend, came back. We just knew something was going on. Went to his um, general doctor. Oh, we're not sure. Christmas rolled around. And right around Christmas is when I started now getting real concerned and pushing his primary care to say, what, what, what are you seeing? And he told me, and I remember it like it was yesterday. It looks like Amore has some compression fractions in his spine and we're like we're why where's that coming from now he had been an athlete and had had some surgery in 2015 but that for um 
um, and L4 and 5, that was taken care of. Everything was fine. So he started wondering, is it related to that? Still, no one knew. They said, okay, let's get scans. Let's do physical therapy. Put him in physical therapy. Let's get that TENS unit for the pain. We did all of that. Amre's trying to stretch his back out, you know, thinking that will help. So New Year's came and finally the beginning of January, January 12th to be exact, he almost collapsed as we were about to go to physical therapy. And so instead of me driving him to physical therapy, I drove him to the ER, pulled up at the door, went in and said, I need a wheelchair. And that was, that's the beginning of that story. Um, within an hour and a half or so, I heard that ER doctor say, put him in room 10. So I go up and say, oh, okay, so good. You're admitting him. And he just kind of looked at me. He said, oh yeah. And I saw the concerned look and, and he said to me, how long has he had kidney disease? And I said, he doesn't. And he said, well, he does. His kidneys, his kidneys aren't working. And I'm like, and so Amre was, even at 57, he was still the athlete, worked out four or five, six times a week. Um, you know, six to 195 pounds, ate better than anybody in the household. Like he took care of himself, was not on any kind of medication, no blood pressure medication, nothing. So the, the nephrologist was called in and they ended up saying to me, his creatinine is 14. Well, that didn't mean anything to me, but she looked at me and she said, it should be under one. And I don't know how he's standing. And so that's the that's when you know the doctor the ER doctor kind of looked at me and said um it might be multiple myeloma and I was like okay but what is that <laughs> and I remember myself saying is that cancer kind of you know inquisitively and he said yeah I'm not sure yet and then he tried to kind of walk it back a little bit but the nephrologist was standing there and 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 she said to me Oh, one of my nurses has it or had it. She she needed to let me know that it was not necessarily a death sentence. She said, we'll figure all this out later. I have to get in, into dialysis. And she worked, they worked their magic. They got that um, catheter put in. He was He was dialyzed that night. And we stayed in that hospital for one solid month because things were happening fast. That that day that they were in doing, you know, dialyzing him. And so then I knew I had to, I had to call people. Um, at that time, the oldest daughter was here, not in living in our house, but in the city. The two were in school. One was a senior in college. One was a senior, one was a sophomore. In the middle of basketball season, remember, this is January, then I knew I had to tell my mom, who was in her 80s at the time. Now, keep in mind, she's known him since he was 17. He's like a son. So I had to tell him. So I got through that. He was admitted. The next morning, bright and early, here comes the nephrologist and her nurse practitioner. Wow, he looks even better from just that one session in dialysis, okay? Every single morning that we were in that hospital, the two of them showed up to say to me and to him, here's what's going on. And you can imagine being in the hospital a month, there were many doctors, there were many specialists. Um, they would come in and kind of give me, okay, he's probably gonna have a blank kind of test today or this is probably what's gonna happen. So it kept me kind of knowing. I have to make note of, the, but my sorority sister gave me a binder that first week. She said, listen, it's gonna be a journey. Take this binder, write everything down that happens. When doctors come in this room, write down their names and who they are. And I did exactly what she told me. But things started to happen. Uh, they would talk to me, he needs this surgery. So his his lesions were up and down his spine. So he needed to have what's called a kyphoplasty to just to, you know, shore up the spine to make it more stable. 
Well, well, he was too sick to give consent. So of course I had to do that. Um, he had that. At one point we had the pulmonary doctor in looking at him. We had a cardiologist looking at him. They finally confirmed the diagnosis and they started to treat him. We thought he was getting better. No, his lungs started to bleed. What, what is going on? It, it was a reaction to the treatment. So now I have pulmonary cardiology and hematology kind of pointing the finger at each other, like what's going on? And they're like, and the hematologist was like, it wasn't what I did. With. It was just all of that. I sat in that hospital and with all of that going on, I, just, I could not leave there. I, I slept in that hospital every single night, but two nights because I was afraid that if I left, a doctor was gonna come in and tell him something else. Remember, we knew nothing about multiple myeloma. It still didn't make sense to me. All I knew was he's not getting better. Things are happening. I need somebody to please, please figure this out. In the beginning, like I said, things were happening so fast that I had to, I, I couldn't fall apart because I had to get the information. I cried. I didn't cry when the doctor would tell me whatever. My crying took place at night when I'm on that, you know, that couch in the hospital room that they made my bed. He's sleep. He's sleeping. I'm crying and praying. So pray, prayer, first of all, got me through. Um, I would leave out of his room sometimes and go sit out in the, in the, lobby area and I would call close friends. I have I have some close friends that are like sisters to me. I went out and I called my own doctor who's a very close friend of mine. Um she just and you know doctors just kind of tell you matter of factly and that's what that's how she did it. She was like, look, if it is that, here's the deal. It is incurable, but it is treatable. I remember those words distinctly. She said, it's going to be rough in the beginning. You know, I was having those kinds of conversations, of course, with my mom, of course, with my sorority sisters. It was a few, a friend from church. And then my pastor was also dropping in. And he would, he would show up at the hospital at 10 and 11 at night because he could always get in. So my pastor, first of all, was on me. And I remember him saying to me, Marsha, you need to stop it. <laughs> he just was like, what are you doing? You are not Wonder Woman. And he said to me, he said, you do so much for other people in our congregation, like from a legal standpoint. You know, people call me and come to me. Let somebody help you. Let somebody help you. What do you need? I was exhausted by then. I had dropped 27 pounds or so in weeks. I knew that I needed to talk to somebody. I'm sitting in this hospital room. He can't communicate with me. The, the kids were, you know, they weren't in a position to, I knew I had to reach out to my closest circle, my village, my village is amazing. So, so what I got from them was talking. So I would advise, talk to somebody, talk to somebody, whomever that might be that you can, that you can trust. And I'm going to say trust because, you know, trust is a huge thing in our culture and we don't always trust. And that's how I got through it. And then I started to make notes to myself about the business things that needed to be taken care of. And that's when the shift happened. I knew that me crying, sitting in that hospital, we had no idea how long we would be there. I knew that I had to take care of some things. I, I'm a lawyer. I have been for 37 years. I'm also, I also have a consulting business and it's market research. I used to work at Procter & Gamble when I was in law school. But meanwhile, I'm sitting in a hospital room and I'm thinking, I do have a mortgage to pay. But I also knew that there were things like disability. Oh, I should be probably, because at some point the, the diagnosis came. So I'm like, I should probably check about disabilities. I had a fight with an insurance company that I won't name because they started sending me letters saying, you took him to this hospital and it is out of network. I'm like, you must be kidding me. I don't know if he's going to walk out of here and you're talking about out of network. So I won that fight because I took him to an ER. And when you go to an ER, who cares about network? 
the doctors were cheering me on. Like they would walk in. I started establishing relationships with all of them. Marsha, what's going on today? And they were asking me about the business of it all. Like, did you beat the insurance company yet? <laughs> like, did you apply for, for uh, what about Medicare? What about Medicaid? What about disability? So that was the relationship. And that was what the environment was like in that room. If I would leave the hospital to come home to shower, to try to lay down for a minute, a nurse would have my phone number and would promise to call me if anything went down in that hospital room. So then I decided that, okay, I have to be part of this medical team. I kind of said to myself, Marcia, yeah, you're going to be part of the medical team too. Because his lesions were up and down his spine, it affected his entire body. Like he couldn't even move his arms. Like he, he, he could move them. He couldn't lift them. So in the hospital bed, he was more comfortable with pillows up under each of his elbows, but I had to do the lifting. <laughs> and then the nurses at times wanted to, but they were going to do it not gentle enough for me. So I'm like, excuse me, I'll do it. Okay. So, so I did that. That's when advocacy started for me. When the doctors would come in, I would connect the dots for them because it was so many of them. Yeah, the decision was pretty much mine. So I shared with him as much as I could. But immediately, I didn't want to burden him with anything. I needed him to concentrate on getting well. And so immediately, I said, listen, he's not going to worry about anything. He's not going to worry about finances. He's not going to worry about this treatment. He's not going to, I'll tell him what he needs to know. Uh, the doctors said to me, you know, we want to start treatment, which they did. And that was the treatment he was allergic to. Um, it was two shots. They gave, I remember that nurse coming in one shot one week, came back and gave him a shot the next week. And that then his lungs started bleeding. And then they figured out that's what it was. But I have to say that those two shots knocked uh, much of those bad cells out like tremendously. So, you know, there's always a good and a bad. And so I'm thankful because it knocked it way down. The, the M protein, it knocked it way down, but they had to stop it. So he had to stop all treatment for some months until his lungs got clear and they figured it out. But what the doctor said was, here's what can happen. Well, we need to treat him. It could be, we'll never give him that again, but it could be, we have pills. You know, my big question was always, is it chemotherapy? And then they were throwing around the words immunotherapy and they had to explain that to me. And so when they started treatment again, they did start him on a regimen of some of the some of the therapies, the pills. OK, I had to be very careful with those. Those things were scary. When I came home, they were like, don't touch them. And oh, by the way, don't let anybody who might be pregnant or would get pregnant in the future touch them. So my girls had to stay. And then they started pretty early talking to me and us about a stem cell transplant. So he was diagnosed in January of 17. By March of 18, he had a stem cell transplant. Love the team that we worked with. Love that team. They told us we met a lot beforehand. And he was well enough then to, he probably was, he stayed in a wheelchair for a while. He had to learn to walk all over again. It was just so many things. But by the time his transplant, he was walking again. Um, so we would, I would take him out to the doctor and they would tell us what was going to happen. They explained exactly, here's what's going to happen. We have to, you know, collect uh, those cells and then we have to he'll go in the hospital and then we're going to give him this heavy dose of chemo and then all of his numbers are going to bottom out and so that transplant was was tough but he did it you know god brought him through that it was hard it happened exactly like they told us uh and i will say i thank god for that transplant um put him in complete response and there is no detection of there's no M spike detection, no protein detection. He gets it checked every month. Just a multitude of emotions. It, it's a journey. <laughs>